good afternoon. Got yourselves a nice meal, maybe a nap. Uh, but I hope and pray that you had yourself a wonderful afternoon. I'm glad to see you back in church tonight. It's good to be here. We're thankful for this building. We can all come together, fellowship, hear the word of God preached. I'm thankful for the air conditioning. I'm thankful for the sunny skies today. Uh, I'm thankful for the services we had this morning, and I'm looking forward to seeing what God has in store for us tonight. Uh, but before we get started, since he's in the back standing up looking so dapper already, I'm going to ask Brother Jim Bush if you'd ask the Lord to bless this service. ask you to stand with me if you're able and turn to page 530.
Amen. Good singing tonight. If you would, turn over to page 186. Page 186. And can it be? Amen. We'll sing this one a cappella. <clears throat>
Amen. You may be seated. Amen. I'm glad this evening that I'm no longer underneath no condemnation. Christ Jesus has set me free from my sin. I'm underneath, no longer underneath the condemnation of God because of my sin. It's been taken care of by the blood of Jesus Christ, and I'm thankful for that. This evening, Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Thank God for that. Thank God for that hymn. Thank you for singing out uh, this evening. It's a blessing to hear you all sing to give glory unto our precious Savior tonight. Let's go ahead and pray before we go forward this evening. Lord, thank you again for this evening, dear God. Thank you, dear God, that, there, that we're no longer under any condemnation, Lord God, those that are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for that sacrifice on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. And Lord, I, you shed your blood, God's blood, on the cross of Calvary to wash away and to make an atonement for my sins. And I'm thankful for that tonight. So, Lord, I ask now, dear God, as we go forward, Lord, that you would lead God and direct and give us what we need. Lord, that we would glorify you in our lives, Lord, and be everything that you desire for us to be for your glory and your honor. And so we ask you for your help tonight, Lord. Open our ears, open our hearts to receive what's contained in your word. We'll pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've been looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. We're still maybe going to be able to finish up tonight the, feeling, the dealings with the body and how he talks about in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, that it would be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The body being preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just a quick review. We know that we have uh, five... Uh, senses that the body makes contact with here in this world. We got sight with what we see with our eyes. We have sound which we hear with our ears and then taste, touch, and smell. And last week we were kind of looking at uh, sound and what we hear and how it can affect our bodies and influence us for either good or evil and how it's very dangerous or I should say how we have to be very careful what we hear. So if you take your Bible, I want to finish up just this thought on hearing this evening. Deuteronomy chapter number 1, finish up this story here. How we looked at how God told the children of Israel to go in and possess the promised land. Yet the spies, when they came back out, the ten of them gave an evil report and two gave a good report. So you had two men that said, we can go in and do this. And he had ten men said, no, we can't go and do this. this is, this is too hard. We can't do it. And it discouraged the hearts of the people. So what the people heard in their ears by the report, this evil report, they didn't go in and get what God wanted them to get because they were influenced by what they heard. And I said this last week, it's very important that we realize that what we hear influences us whether we realize it or not. And just a little uh, forewarning of what I'm going to preach tonight. It's going to be another happy message out of the Bible. I just provide many happy messages out of the Bible. And yeah. But the message I'm going to preach tonight, now we're going to finish up with the hearing, but then we're going to get into the taste. And you don't hear a lot of preachers today preaching on gluttony. So we're going to talk a little bit about food tonight and how we need to be careful with our moderation. You've got a lot of preachers today, they boast on how overweight they are said Baptist, it's meant for Baptists to eat fried chicken and be, uh-uh. No, gluttony's a sin. Moderation, God says to be moderate. So that'll be another happy message here in about a couple minutes. So let's go to Deuteronomy real quick and finish up here in verse 45, four, chapter 1, verse 41. I want to finish up with this thought here, how they receive an evil report, they hear it, they say we can't go do that, then God says, listen, I'm going to bring judgment upon you because you're not trusting me and going to face the enemy and you've listened to what you heard in your ears by this evil report and you've let it influence your life to the point to where God says, okay, you're going to go wander in the wilderness for 40 years. All right? God says, hey, you're done. I heard what you wanted. Okay, you're not going to go in the land. But you're going to go out and you're going to wander out there in that wilderness for 40 years because you wouldn't do what I said and you were influenced by what you heard. But look at chapter 1, verse 41. So after the people get this information, this is what they say in verse 41. 
Then ye answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. When we had girded on every man his weapons uh, of war, ye were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest ye be smitten before your enemies. So I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and went presumptuously up into the hill. So now all of a sudden, when God brings judgment upon them, and God says, okay, I've hurt, see, we got to be careful with what we hear, but we also have to realize that God hears what we say. God hears what we say. And God takes them at their word. They said, we can't go do it. And God says, okay, you're not going to trust me. You're not going to go in my strength and in my might. And you're not going to go off of all these other miracles that you've seen me do and how I provided for you. You see, brethren, God is so gracious with us. God is so gracious with us and God is so merciful with us. And God, I'm so thankful that God just brings us along, that God just doesn't throw us into the midst of the fire in a sense. God brings us along and God strengthens us. But we get into trouble that when God brings us along and God expects us now to walk on our own and we're still wanting to be like we're two years old and God says, hey, you're now 12 years old. You need to start doing what you need to be doing as a 12-year-old now. And what happened with the children of Israel is they've had a number of experiences with God to know that God's with them. And so when they get to the point to get into the promised land where God said he was going to bring them, a place of, of, of milk and honey, a place of water, a place of, of pastures, a place of houses that they don't have to build, the promised land that God said, I'm going to give you, when they get to that point, they said, no, we can't do it. It's too hard. We can't do it. It's too hard. And basically what they're doing is they're bringing a reproach against the God that brought them out. Basically what they're saying is, God, we don't trust you, God, you can't do this. God, this is too much for you, so we can't do it. And you brought us all out here just to die. And God says, okay, I hear what you're saying. You're not going in. And so God tells them not going in. Now all of a sudden, when they get word that they can't go in, now they're like, oh, no, 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 wait, hang on. No, we got our sword. We're gonna, we'll go in tomorrow, Moses. We'll go take the land. Too late. Too late. You've already said you can't do it. And now all of a sudden they say, we can do it. And again, they rebel against the words of God. God says, you can't do it now. No, we're going to do it. God says, do it. No, we can't do it. They can't make up their mind. They can't figure out what they want to do. But all of a sudden when God now brings judgment, it's too late. It's too late to say we can do it. God says, no, no, no. I'm taking you at your word. You're not going in. They say, no, we're going to go in. God says, no, you're not going in now. Because look what happens in verse number 44. And the Amorites, which dwelt in the mountain, came out against you and chased you as bees do and destroyed you to Seir, even unto Hormah. And you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hearken to your voice nor give ear unto you. So ye abode in Kadesh many days according unto the days that ye abode there. They couldn't hear. They went in presumptuously. Now that word presumptuously means this, willfully. Presumptuously means in bold defiance of conscience or violation of known duty. They willfully and presumptuously went against God numerous times and they went up there and they got hurt because God said don't do it and they said no God we will do it. God says oh no you won't do it and they went anyways and they got their, their cans kicked and they come back crying to Moses and the Lord and God's like I'm not hearing you. God says, I'm not hearing you. God says, I told you, you couldn't do it. And you went presumptuously, you went willfully and said, we will do it. And God says, no, you won't. No, you won't. And they came running back with their tails tucked between their legs. Brethren, they had uncircumcised ears. And I'll explain here in a second. Can you or do you hear the words of God? What can hinder someone from not hearing the words of God? I just said it, uncircumcised ears. Absent, uncircumcised basically means absent or want of circumcision. Take your Bible and look at Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 10. Do we only hear what we want to hear? 
And then all of a sudden, when someone takes us at our word, then all of a sudden, we didn't realize that they would take us at their, at their, at their, word, at their word. And now all of a sudden, we want to change things up. And that's exactly what the children of Israel did. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 10. Jeremiah 6. And look at verse number 10. <clears throat> Jeremiah 6, verse number 10. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. They hear the words of God, but their ears are not circumcised. Therefore, they will not hear and do what God says. Take your Bible and look at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 and verse number 51. Often you find in the Bible an uncircumcised heart but you also find uncircumcised ears. Because I believe before you can ever get to the heart, it's got to come in through the ears. Acts chapter 7, and look at verse number 51. Stephen was preaching to that crowd there, that religious crowd. And as Stephen's preaching to the Pharisees, look what he says at the very end. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Peter tell, or Peter, Stephen tells that crowd, as he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to them, he says, you're stiff-necked and you're uncircumcised, not only in your heart, but in your ears, and ye do always resist, who? The Holy Ghost. He says, the Holy Ghost will be speaking to you. The Holy Ghost is trying to get your attention. The Holy Ghost is trying to show you something. And you resist them, not just from your heart, because your heart's hard, or that you're stiff-necked, but you've got uncircumcised ears. You only hear what you want to hear. And you won't hear what God says. Brethren, I always want to hear what God says. Even if I don't like it. Even if I don't like it. I pray, God, God, help me to receive those things, even, Lord, that I don't like to hear. Why? Because, God, I know you're trying to make me a better person for your glory and your honor. So I pray tonight that we don't have uncircumcised ears. You see, in Scripture, uncircumcised ears are often associated with an uncircumcised heart and a stiff neck. A heart that is waxed gross and a neck that will not bow before the Lord and his word is in trouble. And you find that in Matthew 13. Take the Bible, look at that real quick. Matthew 13. May we always have ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. And the Holy Spirit of God speaks through the Word of God, the truth. Matthew chapter 13, and look at verse number 10. Actually, jump down to verse 15. Matthew 13, verse 15. Look what the Lord says. For this people's heart, Matthew 13, 15, for this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Why? Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and he says here, and your ears, for they hear. Are you willing to hear what the Holy Spirit will speak to you through his word? Now again, I'm not talking about an audible voice that we're asking God to give us from heaven. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. You say, well, how does the Holy Spirit speak to us? The Holy Spirit bears witness to truth. Well, what is truth? The Bible is truth. So as we read our Bibles, the Holy Spirit ought to be bearing with us, with our spirit, and speaking us to us through his word saying, that's true, that's right, this applies to you, this doesn't apply to you, yeah, I think you should do that, no, I don't think you should do that. The Holy Spirit should be leading and guiding you and directing you as you spend time in the Bible and as you walk close to God through him. But people won't hear because they have uncircumcised ears. Do you have ears to hear? In Romans 2, 28, it says this, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is, an out, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. 
You see, when you get saved, a spiritual circumcision takes place, a cutting away takes place when you get saved. And you're made a new creature in Jesus Christ. You, now, you are now born of the Spirit, and it is cut away from this flesh that you still dwell in. Now, as we move into the next section of what we're going to look at, take your Bible, and I want you to turn over to um, um, Second. I think it's 2 Peter. No, I think it's 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Yes, 1 Peter chapter 2, and look at verse number 11. 1 Peter 2, 11. All right, so a spiritual circumcision, not only of the heart, but also of the ears, to be able to hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Philippians 3.3 3 says, as you're turning to 1 Peter, Philippians 3.3 3 says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and look at verse number 11. And before we read that, I want to say something. I don't trust this right here. I don't trust my flesh. I got saved, but I didn't get a new body yet. I'm still waiting the redemption of my body. I don't have a new body yet, but my spirit has been born again of God. You can't see that part of me because it's in there with my spirit and my soul. That has been born again. That has been made new. This stuff right here has not been made new. My flesh. Not been made new. And every day, I got to battle this stuff right here, my flesh. And the Bible talks about, in Galatians, it talks about the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And every day, we talked about it this morning, you need to take that flesh, and that flesh has got to go on a cross, and you've got to die to self in order for the spirit to live. Renewing and strengthening the inner man. That's your spirit and your soul. But you still got this flesh that you need to mortify daily and put it to death. I'll show you. Look here, 1 Peter chapter 2. And look what Peter tells the brethren there in 1 Peter 2, verse 11. He says, Dearly beloved, he really cares for these people. He says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you. He's just not asking them, he's beseeching them because he knows the battle. Look at this. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which what which war against what the soul you see that this morning this evening you have a, if you're saved you should be able to testify now that you have a war going on inside here i know since i've gotten saved there's been many battles and wars inside here between my flesh and my spirit because again I don't have a new body yet. I'm still, I'm still waiting for that glorious day when, I'm, when my body is uh, translated and I'm given a new body and I don't have to deal with this old flesh no more. I can't wait for that day. But until that day happens, every morning, afternoon, night, I got to be worried about this flesh because this flesh can still sin. My spirit can't. My spirit's been born again of God. But I can still do things in this flesh that are not honoring and pleasing to God. And so Peter tells the brethren, he says, Brethren, dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, that you abstain from fleshly lust, which war against your soul. Because this flesh still wants to do what pleases this flesh. This flesh still wants to please itself. And Peter's telling the brethren, listen, you need to bring your flesh into subjection, put it on that cross, and walk in a new man now, and in the spirit, and not in the flesh no more. But this flesh, when you start to put this flesh to death, you're going to have a battle on your hands. Because this flesh is going to say, mm, no, it's going to try to want to make concessions with you. Well, I'll do this, but what about not that? Just try to wake up early in the morning and start trying to pray for an hour. And see if your flesh will like that. Your flesh, real quick, is going to say, Maybe later on when we're awake. I'm too tired right now to do that. Your flesh immediately is going to start talking like, eh, no, nah, not right now. And the spirit's like, yeah, I want the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit's like, I want to be a great prayer warrior for God, and then I'm going to start tomorrow, and I'm going to do this, and then the next day gets here, and no, I'm too tired. See, we're great warriors the night before, 
But when the battle comes, now all of a sudden, yeah, I got, I'm too tired. I've worked too late last night. I got, all these excuses start flooding in. Go ahead and try to start to fast. Try to do a two or three day fast. Oh, you're three hours in and you're like, man, I need a snack. Man, you ain't even gone for three hours, I know, but I'm so hungry. I'm going to starve to death. No, you ain't starving to death. Your flesh is saying, I don't like what you're putting me under. Give me a cracker or something. Right? That's the flesh warring against the spirit. The flesh doesn't want to do the things that please God, but the spirit does. And it's a constant battle. And if we don't recognize it, the devil can really beat us up with it. Paul or Peter gives a warning here against the fleshly lust. You, every one of you out there, and myself included, we have fleshly lust that war against our souls. And for everybody, it's something different. But God wants us to bring it into subjection, and not only bring it to subjection, God wants us to mortify it, which means kill it, take it out. Because it will bring dishonor to our Savior. You see, brethren, you say, preacher, I have no clue what you're talking about. You see, you can only get victory over the flesh if you're saved. So, preacher, I can't do these things. Well, then, do you have the Holy Spirit of God? Because if you have the Holy Spirit of God, you ought to be able to bring your flesh into subjection. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but the power and the availability and the ability to do so is there now because you now have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within you. Now, take your Bible and let's look at this good subject right here on gluttony. Taste. Take your Bible and look at Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse number 18. Deuteronomy 21, verse number 18. Deuteronomy 21, verse number 18. The word taste means this, to perceive by means of the tongue, to have a certain sensation in consequence of something applied to the tongue. It's an organ of taste. You know, one thing that I'm thankful for and my pastor back home would talk about this all the time, I'm thankful that God gave us taste buds. God didn't have to give us taste buds. He could have just said, here's food, eat it, and there's no enjoyment to it whatsoever, and it's just something to sustain you, to keep you alive. But our God is so good that he even gave the details to where he gave us taste buds to where we're able to taste foods, and I'm thankful for that. I've known some individuals who have lost their taste and they, it almost led them to take their own life because they couldn't handle not being able to taste nothing no more. And I couldn't imagine going through the rest of my life not being able to taste food. Food is wonderful, and I love the taste of different foods. But it has to be done in moderation. It has to be done in moderation. Gluttony. Gluttony is only mentioned a few times in the Bible. But the word gluttony means excess in eating extravagant indulgences of the appetite for food. Moderation means restraint of violent passions or indulgences of appetite. It says, eat and drink with moderation. You see, the sin of gluttony is taken very seriously in Scripture. One must be able to control his appetites, especially in the matters of food and drink. So look here in Deuteronomy 21, and look at verse number 18. If a man have a stubborn and a rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother. And here we got clear direction in scriptures that we are to be obedient to our fathers and our mothers, especially if we still reside within their homes. All right? Well, it says, this was a rebellious son. He wouldn't obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother. And that when they have chastened him, he will not hearken unto them. Basically, they've tried correcting him. They've tried chastening him. It's not working. Verse number 19. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city, of his city, and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. Look what it says. And he is a glutton 
and a drunkard. And they let him go home. <laughs> I'm glad we're not in Old Testament times. I'm glad that we're under grace right now. Because look what it says in verse number 21. And all the men in the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. You think our government, you think things are rough with the way things are done in society today. Back then in the Old Testament times in Israel, you had a rebellious and a stubborn son that after you tried to correct him and help him to get where you need him to be, but he would not listen, and he was rebellious and stubborn and then also a glutton and a drunkard, the Bible says that the father and mother would take him to the elders of the city before the gate and say, hey, this our son is rebellious and he's stubborn. He won't listen to us. We've tried correcting him. He's, he's a glutton. He's a drunk. He's basically good for nothing. And the elder says, okay, and they start picking up stones and they kill him. That's pretty horrific, ain't it? No. It's so that others would fear and get on the right track. You see what's going on today? There's no fear for doing wrong no more. I guarantee you, brethren, I know this may sound rough, people say, you're crazy. I'm telling you, if you get somebody thieving all the time, and you take off their left hand, uh, you put a notice out there to the rest of the thieves that are thinking about stealing something, they're going to think twice before they steal something, they realize they're going to lose their left hand. Amen. They do that over in Saudi Arabia. Over there in some of those Arab countries, you get caught stealing, you go into the, the town square in front of everybody, and if you're found guilty, they take off one of your hands. <laughs> And guess what it does to everybody else that's around there? Yeah, no, it's not worth losing my hand over. They don't steal. I was reading something in one of those books back there. Um, back, I think it was the 1600s or 1700s. If you got caught stealing, sometimes they would, they would tattoo or imprint a symbol in your head to let others know you're a thief. If you got caught in adultery or fornication, they will put something on you that others that ran across you realize you're an adulterer and you're a thief. And it made you feel like this small, but it would put a warning out to everybody else, hey, don't go out there and sin and do wrong. And I get you, guess what? They have a very low crime rate in Saudi Arabia. And you would have a lot less crime in this country if you started taking some of those drastic measures. You would straighten a lot of people up because they realize, mm, no, it's not worth it. Someone gets caught molesting a kid, take them out. But we let it go, and we try to reform them. You, no, give them the gospel. Hey, you got three months, we're giving you the gospel. Here's Jesus Christ. If not, you're gone. And guess what it's going to do to every other pervert out there that's thinking about raping a kid? You better think twice, because you get caught, you're dead. I'm telling you, God don't play games. But here in America today, we want to try to help everybody. No, we need, we're too soft. And look at the mess we're in today. You say, this preacher, don't make me president of the United States. <laughs> I'm telling you. But when you deal with people who've been hurt, and they get a little slap on the wrist and they get to go home, or they do five years in prison and they get released, and then when they're in prison, they're like, oh, it's so bad for me. I don't deserve this. I really didn't mean to do it. And you killed somebody. This is just too hard for me. It's harder for me to bear. And, and I, 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 You just killed somebody. It reminds me of the spirit of Cain. He goes and kills his brother. He kills his brother and then the Lord comes. My punishment is more than I can bear. You killed your brother. It's a spirit of Cain that's not right. In the Old Testament, God didn't play around with sin. If you were a rebellious and a stubborn son, you wouldn't listen to your voice of your father and your mother. God said, okay, this is how you deal with it so that other kids out there will fear to learn to listen to their dad and mom. And guess what that then leads to? They'll listen to dad and mom, and then when they get older, they'll listen to the policeman. And then when they get older, they'll listen to the judge. And when they get older, they'll listen to their teachers and their principals. And when they get older, they'll listen to their boss and won't back, back talk their boss. They'll be obedient to those that are that are over them with authority. But now today, everybody's got a voice and nobody can submit themselves to an authority. God had it straight back there and these kids, the son, was a glutton. He couldn't control his appetites. Proverbs 23, verse 19. Take your Bible and flip over there real quick this evening. 
You say, this is a happy message. This is good stuff tonight. Brethren, this is stuff that's needful. We, we're, we're serving a holy God. We're serving, we're serving a God that's holy, that's righteous. And listen, our God, brethren, think about this tonight. Our Father in heaven is so holy that he allowed his son to be beaten, spit upon, mocked, whipped, put on a cross because he's so holy he cannot and will not allow sin into heaven. The father hates sin so much that he can have nothing to do with sin that he was willing to send his son to die for sinners. That's how much he despises sin and that was the cost of our sin. God's son had to die for us. The one who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now look at Proverbs 23 and look at verse number 19. Proverbs 23 verse 19. Hear thou my son and be wise and guide thine heart in the way. Look what it says in verse 20. Be not among wine bibbers, drinkers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. He says in verse 23, Buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Solomon gives warning. Solomon gives warning to his son, and he says, Hear thou, my son, be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Solomon says to his son, Son, don't be among wine bibbers. Don't be among those that are riotous eaters of the flesh. Because he says in verse 21, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. Solomon's telling his son, Son, you better be careful who you keep company with. Son, don't keep company with drunkards and those that are glutton, gluttons. They can't control their appetites. Be careful that you stay away from them so that you don't fall into the same sins. You know why I preach some of the things? So we don't fall into the same sins. So that we stay pure and holy before our God. Now, he says here in Proverbs 23, riotous eaters of flesh, in verse 20. The word riotous means this. It means luxurious. It means wanton or licentiousness in festive indulgences. Brethren, I didn't quite understand that word when I first read it. I thought it was like some type of big old party and all that. And No, it means luxurious. And you know, I think this is the right word. I meant to look it up earlier, but I think it's the right word. We become Epicureans. Look, just turn on the TV. How many shows there are on food? You got shows on food to where you got judges and panels saying, uh, yeah, this is, this is lacking a little bit of salt here with this and, 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 and this right here. We become Epicureans. We're critics now of food. And it's going to be to our damnation. We're too picky today. Now, I'm not, but understand, I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about our society as a whole. Well, this is too cold, and this is a little too hot, and it's got a little too much salt in it. I think you need to add a little bit of this and that. One. Epicureans, luxurious, riotous eaters of flesh. And the Bible gives warning against it. The Bible says, be thankful for any kind of food you got. There's some people in this world today who would be thankful with just a cup full of rice tonight. I know that for a fact. I know for a fact tonight that there's kids going to sleep tonight, even in this country, are going to sleep tonight without any food. In this country. Much less the rest of the world. Yet you got TV shows who are just nitpicking every little thing about the food that's being prepared before them. That's, that's sinful. That's sinful. And Solomon tells his son, be not, uh, be not among riotous eaters of the flesh, those that are luxurious, those that have fancy. And be very, very careful. Be very careful. 
Because you know what that leads to? An unthankful heart and attitude. I try to pray, Lord willing, I try to pray before every one of my meals and say, God, thank you for this food I got in front of me tonight. Because I know there could come a day where I might be trying, like some people during World War II, were eating tree bark or dandelion roots or roots in general because it got so bad during World War II over there in Europe, they were eating whatever they could try to get their hands on. Brethren, we need to be thankful for every ounce of food that we get every day. Brethren, I was reading about Louis Zamperini, Zamperini, however you say his last name, uh, in a book written on him, Unbroken, and there was a movie. I didn't watch the movie, but the book. That man, they were on that life raft after their plane crashed in World War II over there in the Pacific. He was on that life raft for, I believe, 41 days. 41 or 42 days, they were on a life raft. It got so bad that the raft got so brittle from being baking in the sun that it was just falling apart. Their bodies were so sunburned. I forget how much weight him and the three men that were on that raft lost. He said it got so bad that when they first crashed, they had a little life kit on that life raft. They changed some things. At World War II, the president and some of the, uh, those in upper government realized that they needed to put more rations on the life rafts because their B-24 planes were going down left and right. So they started making some changes of the rations that they would put on these planes, on these life rafts, because they knew some of these men would have to spend sometimes a couple days before they might be rescued. Well, it hadn't reached in that life raft yet. And so when they crash landed and he opened up those two life rafts, all they had on it was, I believe, one chocolate bar. That's all they had. And one of the men, three of them survived, and one of the men got so scared that in the middle of the night, he ate the whole thing himself. So they were without food. 40 days. I think over 40 days. It got so bad that they got so hungry that they would lay there on that lap. And they couldn't get in the water because of the sharks. The sharks would come up and try to attack the raft. and It was, it was a mess. And so one day, they're just sitting there, and they're praying for rain to come through. It's amazing when you're in bad situations, you start praying. But they were praying for rain. The clouds would come over, and they would just try to open their mouth to get any type of water in. And he said, Louis said he was laying in life raft one day, and they're laying there, and they're just half out of it. And all of a sudden, a seagull lands on top. Or a bird, I think it was a seagull, lands on near, to, near his head. And he's like, and they're like, they're all like, he snap, grabs that seagull, cracks its neck open, and he said he was so hungry, he just started going And we're going to complain about food we have today. It's just not exactly like I want it. And no, when you're hungry, you don't know what you'll do to try to get some food in your stomach. And that man was willing to basically eat a live seagull to try to stay alive. And they would do that for the rest of the trip. They would try to catch the birds come. They would try to catch some type of fish. And they would eat it raw because that's all they had. I'm saying tonight brethren, that we shouldn't go to our I'm not saying tonight that we shouldn't go to our favorite restaurant. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that not let our flesh get to a point to where we start being critics of the food that we eat and are not thankful for the very food that God gives us. Every moment, every meal, I'm thankful for what God gives me something to eat. Because I try to keep it in the back of my mind to realize I might not have food tomorrow. Something might happen. And I might not be able to eat food tomorrow. God, help me to be thankful for what I have today, God, because you're good to me. I'm thankful that God gives me dessert to eat sometimes. I'm thankful that I have ice cream sometimes. I'm thankful that I like donuts. I like food. And it's all right to like food, but God does not want us to become gluttonous and critics of it. Does it make sense? All right, so... I'm going to close with these passages right here tonight. Look at Numbers chapter 11 and verse number 1. Numbers chapter 11, verse number 1. Gluttony, excessive eating, indulgences of the appetite for food. Numbers chapter 11. And look at verse number 1. We have these things. God's given us these examples in the Old Testament to be end samples for us, for us to learn from. Numbers chapter 11, verse number 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. 
And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Verse number four now. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. Remember what we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, 11, fleshly lusts which war against the soul? Well, there was a mixed multitude that came out with the children of Israel when they were delivered from Pharaoh and Egypt. A mixed multitude came out with them. You had some, it's a picture of salvation, brother. You have some that came through the blood and others that came that didn't come through the blood. There were some there in Egypt that followed along with the Israelites and it was a mixed multitude. And if it was an Egyptian that came out, he didn't come out through the blood. Because they didn't have to put the blood on the doorposts, but the children of Israel did. So you had some that came out, but they didn't come out through the blood. And they fell a lusting. And all of a sudden, who they really are starts coming out, and it was a mixed multitude, and they fell of lusting. And look what the Bible says in verse number um, 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also, look at that word also, the children of Israel also wept again and said, look what they say, who shall give us flesh to eat? Hmm. Your flesh wants the good food. Look what he said in verse 5. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic and the flavor and the spice and something that just pleased our tongue, but now we fell a lusting and we're tired of this light bread, this manna that God's given us. We remember the wonderful things we had in Egypt, the, the fish and the garlic and the melons and, and, and the onions, and, and it tasted so wonderful, but yet you're not talking about the bondage that you were under and this, the slave taskmasters that you had over you. You see, that's often what the devil will do after you're saved. He'll put in there, hey, do you remember when you had this and you remember when you did that? But he doesn't remind you of all the bad things either. He'll just remember you, remember the good things. And this mixed multitude starts affecting God's children, the children of Israel, and they begin to despise the light bread. Now jump down for the sake of time, because it's the same context, you can read it later on, down to verse number 31. So they fell, up, they fell a lusting. They're starting to remember what they had in Egypt. And this angers God. All right? God hears them complaining. God hears them saying things about wonderful things about Egypt. God hears them complain about not having fish and the garlic and the onions. The Lord hears that. And look at verse 31. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. So look, you got the, I'm almost done here, you got, you got the camp of Israel, over a million people, it's a big camp. God gets so furious with them, he calls an east wind to come in with quail, birds. He gives them so many birds that on this side of the camp, and on this side of the camp, there were so many birds that God brought in, it was about two cubits high full of birds. God's basically saying, you want flesh? I'm going to give you flesh to where it's going to come out your nostrils. God says, I heard you complaining. You want it? Here it comes. Whoosh. Can you imagine that many birds around you? Two cubits high? But look what happens. Verse 32. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers. And they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. Look at verse 33. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, they didn't even have an opportunity to chew it in this situation. The wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. 
And they called the name of that place Kibroth Hatava because there they buried the people that, what? Lusted. Brethren, if you go back to, I believe it's Exodus chapter 16, God had provided them manna and quail at night. Manna in the morning, quail at night. God provided, God provided food for them. But they get to a point to where they start lusting about what they used to have. And they start complaining about what Egypt provided for them. Now, can you imagine God hearing this? Because again, what's that saying to God? God, you're not doing what, God, you really don't care about me. The devil and the world cares more about me, God, and pleasing me than you do, God. And God says, oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah, the world just gives me this, and the world gives me that, and this pleases me, and that pleases me, and God says, okay, you want that? Here, you're going you're gonna to get what you want, and you're going to lose something as well. There was nothing wrong with eating what God provided, but they were eating it lustfully, and they were gorging themselves. And I'll prove it to you. Take your Bible and close with Psalm 78. They were overeating. Psalm 78, and let's look at verse 14. Their sin was not that they were eating the quail. Their sin was that they were overeating. They were gluttonous. They were not showing moderation, and they were basically just overfeeding their flesh. Brethren, you know, I, I, I've done it a few times, and I've always paid for it. But you take the, um, oh, what's it called now? What's the place down in Lancaster? Shady, Shady Maple. That is a haven for gluttony. <laughs> That's the truth. You go in that place and there's so much food, you can't even, you can't even describe how much food is in that place. And everything looks so wonderful. That's one of the problems with church get-togethers. Where the ladies make something from the church and everything looks so good and your plate is only this big. But how bad would it look if you had three plates full because you're trying to try everything that you see? And you go to a place like Shady Maple, and I'm not saying not go there, but I'm saying that's a place you got to be careful because you can walk out of there feeling like you got to throw up because you ate so much. And sometimes you feel like you got to eat so much because you paid so much to go in there. <laughs> I paid $80. I'm going to be this big when I walk out there. Sometimes we eat past when we have to, we just keep eating. We just eat because we need to eat. Or we don't need to eat, but we eat. And God says that's where you start getting into trouble because that starts turning into gluttony. Again, a balance tonight. I'm almost done, but there's a balance God doesn't want us going too far to the right saying, well, I'm not going to eat nothing no more, and I'm going to starve myself the rest of my days, and if I do anything, I'm only going to eat bread, and I'm only going to drink water, because I'm going to show God that I really love him. You're, you're on the wrong side. You're taking it too far this side now. And then you can't be all the way over here on this side and say, you know what, I'm going to show no restraint. I'm going to eat if it comes across my plate. And, and like most preachers, bless God, I'm, going to, I'm a Baptist, and I'm, I'm going to keep eating. No, you're taking it, you're glutton. God wants us to have a right balance right in the middle to enjoy properly what he's given us to enjoy and not take it too far to the right or too far to the left. A right balance. So don't go out here tonight saying the preacher doesn't, and preacher, preacher Chris said I can't enjoy a donut. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying don't eat the whole box at one setting. <laughs> yeah, my wife just... No. She's going to be throwing a hymn book at me here soon. Yeah, I'll just keep moving. I'll keep moving, dear. I'll keep moving. But look at Psalm 78. We'll close with verse 14 here, through verse 14. Just, re just see what, this is a recap. This is, this is being reestablished what happened back there in Numbers. Uh, Psalm 78, look at verse 14. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire, he clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against him 
by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. Brethren, we can provoke God. They provoked Him in the wilderness. Verse 18, And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, He smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can He give bread also? Can He provide flesh for His people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and his anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full, he caused an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by his power he brought it in. He brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust, and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea, and he let it fall in the midst of their camp, round about their habitation. Now look at verse twenty-nine. So they did eat, and were filled, and they should have stopped. There's a problem. They ate and they were filled for he gave them their own desire. Look what it says next though. They were not estranged from their lust but while their meat was yet in their mouths the wrath of God came upon them and slew that what? The fattest of them and smote them down the chosen men of Israel. You know what the problem was? The problem was not eating that what God provided. The problem is they ate and they were filled and they kept eating. And they kept eating. And they kept eating. And the Lord says, the Bible says, and he slew the fattest of them, the ones that could not control their appetites, and it was affected in their weight because they were gluttonous. Brethren, again, I said this ain't a popular message. But God expects us to try to take care of our bodies as best we can. Now, I'm not saying to go out here and have a gym membership and, and you'll be able to bench press 300 pounds and you can run three miles in two minutes and all this other nonsense. I'm not, because the Bible says bodily exercise profiteth little. But what I am saying tonight is there is a sin if you push it with your eating when God's saying, uh, you, need to, you need to check up on this because this is something that you're lusting after and it's affecting your walk with me. I hope that makes sense tonight. God expects us to try to take care of our bodies as best as we possibly can try to take care of our bodies. And God expects us to be responsible with the temple that He's given us to live in to bring Him glory and honor till He calls us home. Well, I'm going to die anyways. I'm just going to eat and eat. No, you're, you're, being a, you're speaking as a fool speaks. That's only God's, that's God's realm when to take you home. And if we know we should be having a certain diet because it might prolong our life a little bit to bring more glory and honor to God, then so be it. That's the way it ought to be. And we should never get an attitude, well, I'm getting ready to die, so I'm just going gonna, 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 to become gluttonous because I'm dying anyways. That's not right with God. So God expects us to be able to control our appetites. And most of the times, brethren, I close this up here tonight, most of the times people that can't control their appetites will also not be able to control other areas in their life. They won't be able to control their anger. They won't be able to control their anxiety. They won't be able to control this. There are a lot of things they won't be able to control because they can't even control their very appetite. And what you can see physically, I guarantee you they're not controlling the things you can't see that are spiritual. Brother, this is serious with God tonight. I know we can laugh at some of the things like that, but there's some people that the Bible says, God says, God, God shows no, God has no room for gluttony. And to where we just pig out because we just want to pig out to pig out. Mm -mm. God says we ought to be moderate. We ought to be moderate in our eating and not to please our flesh and the lust of our flesh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity this evening, Lord. I thank you for your mercy and your grace and your goodness. Thank you for your word. 
Lord, I pray you'd help me in these areas, dear God. Lord, in the great nation, Lord, the great nation that you've given to us to live in, Lord, a nation that is plenteous in food. Lord, I pray, God, you'd help me, Lord, with this, these very things, dear God, to, to watch my appetites, dear God. Lord, not that we can't enjoy things. Lord, you've given us all things to richly enjoy, but Lord, you expect us to use moderation. So Lord, I pray you'd help myself and I pray you'd help the brethren tonight, Lord, that we would be moderate in our eating, Lord. Lord, that we wouldn't be gluttonous. Lord, that we wouldn't be riotous eaters of the flesh. But Lord, we would control our passions and our appetites so that we'd be pleasing and glorifying and honoring to you. So Lord, help us with these matters this evening, Lord. Help us to walk with you and help us to stay faithful. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your words. And Lord, help us to now apply them. And we pray these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to close with a hymn tonight. Page number, I believe it's 282 in the Blue Hymn Book. Page number 282. Ellie's going to come up and play it for us, and we'll sing it out tonight. Page 282 in the Blue Hymn Book. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for church. Lord, we thank you for the word of God and the truth that we find in it. Lord, and though on a subject that isn't often preached, and in some ways we can laugh about it, Lord, but I think if we'd all admit it, we've all uh, would admit before you we've been gluttonous some way with food. Lord, we live in a country where we have an abundance. Lord, where there are, although some people going hungry, Lord, it's, it's not like in other nations where uh, people are fighting for their food. Lord, we have grocery stores and everywhere, several in our neighborhoods, Lord, just an abundance of food. And I know for myself, sometimes it's just easy. You think, ah, just one more bite, and next thing you know, you have regret, Lord. And I, uh, as much as we all can joke, Lord, I think we all know that this is a, a thing you take seriously, uh, Lord. And I pray that you'd help us to take it seriously as well, Lord, that we could uh, control how we eat, what we eat, that we do it for your glory. Lord, for strength that we can serve you better. Lord, now we can also take this principle and apply it to other areas of our lives, Lord, that we would live with moderation, Lord, and not be gluttonous uh, in any area of our lives, Lord. Help us, Lord, to serve you. Lord, help us to walk with you, to continue to be in your word, be in prayer, and just uh, enjoy the fact that we have a God in heaven that wants to have a relationship with us, Lord. Help us to never take that for granted. Lord, I pray that you'd give our pastor and his family safety, 
as they travel to, to their son's wedding here, Lord. I pray that they would just have a blessed time, that they would be able to have a great time of fellowship. I pray, Lord, that uh, as you join these two together, Lord, that you'd bless their marriage and that you'd help them to serve you all the days of their lives, Lord, that they'd bring you honor through their marriage. Lord, I pray also you bring our pastor and his family home safely to us. Lord, I pray you be with each man that uh, preaches during this week, Lord, uh, just uh, that your will would be done, Lord, and that you would speak to hearts. Lord, if it be your will, I pray you bring us back again Sunday morning, Lord, and we'll thank you, or Wednesday night, rather, and we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. It goes beyond